because this section is getting into um, calorimetry, which is what we're going to be doing in lab on Thursday. So we've learned that a system exchanges energy with its surroundings via heat, Q, and pressure volume work, W. So this illustration, we have the system, and we define that. We define that however is convenient for the problem you're trying to solve. And we've got the sur surroundings, everything else. And so energy can be transferred here by heat, Q equals MC delta T, or by work, negative P delta V, or a combination of the two. The change in internal energy is the sum of the heat and the work, right? So delta E equals Q plus W. And remember, we just learned that W equals negative P delta V. What if the change in volume is zero? Then the work is zero, right? If this is zero, then the work is zero. And so then, it's a simpler, we can say the change in internal energy is just equal to Q, the heat, because no work was done. So here we're saying delta E for the chemical reaction is equal to QV, and this subscript V signifies that we're talking about heat exchanged at constant volume. It isn't practical to observe the change in temperature of chemical reactants and products, right? Most of these reactions are going to occur in um, a solution dissolved in water, or they're, at the very least, like if you have gases reacting, they are mixed together and you can't take the temperature of each of them separately. It's just, it's difficult. So what we do is instead of trying to measure the temperature change in the system, we measure the temperature change in the surroundings. And one way to do this is using a bomb calorimeter. So here we're going to surround the chemical reaction with a container that is well insulated. And so we can ignore the universe outside of the container. We can assume that there's very little heat lost from the container into the air and the table, etc. So we can just look at the, the calorimeter, the bomb calorimeter. <coughs> so here we have the system, that's the chemical reaction that we're interested in. The Q for the system would equal negative Q for the surroundings. The surroundings is the calorimeter, and so that's equal to negative Q for the calorimeter. Calorimetry is a technique where we measure calories, right? That's literally what its name means. It's a technique used to measure the heat of reaction by observing the change in the temperature of the surroundings. So the system is the reaction, and we're going to observe a change in temperature of the surroundings. And because Q for the surroundings is equal but opposite in sign to Q for the system, we can figure out what Q for the system is without measuring it directly. So here's an illustration of a bomb calorimeter. Nothing explodes here. It's not too exciting. But this, is, this part in here is what's called the bomb. Um, it's a tightly sealed chamber. And these, um, this bomb calorimeter is, is often used to measure heats of reaction for combustion reactions. So you put something in here that you're trying to uh, measure the energy change for the combustion of this thing. You do it like with a peanut or something, and then they do this with food to figure out the calorie content. So you put the sample in here, and there's oxygen inside of the container. It's airtight and watertight so that the volume of this cannot change. And then we have an ignition wire which I think is why it seems like a bomb, because, you know, you've got the detonation thing and you're going to but it doesn't actually explode. So you ignite this. The sample burns in oxygen. Because it's in a closed container, it's not allowed to expand in volume. 
And so no work can be done. So all of the energy has to be released as heat. And the heat goes into the water surrounding the bomb. So we have an insulated container here, kind of like a Yeti cooler, right? Super duper cooler. And we've got a bunch of water in here. We've got a thermometer so that we can measure the temperature change in the water without opening it up. We've got a stirring mechanism here to keep the water moving around so that we don't have localized hot spots or cold spots. It's, it's uniform in temperature. Now we don't get to use one of these in class, but. Well, the, the stirring mechanism could cause some heat of its own, but the motor is out here. And so the motor might, and probably will, give off some heat, but because that's outside of the calorimeter itself, it's not going to matter. Yeah? So like, even though there's work being done by the motor that is affecting the water inside, that would affect the number? Correct. So this little um, propeller stirring mechanism here, so stirring water, is doing work. But that work is not going to affect the temperature of anything. And so that work is completely unrelated to the work that could happen here from an expanding volume. Can I have another question? Mm -hmm. do, do, like, is it already pre the amount of heat absorbs in the thermometer will like for the, in the... That's an excellent question. You guys have some really good questions. So what about the thermometer? Isn't that absorbing some heat? Yes, it is. It is. Um, in a well-designed calorimeter here, the size of the thermometer relative to the amount of water would be small. And so the thermometer would absorb a small fraction of the heat, and that shouldn't affect the results. Now, the experiment we're going to do in class, we're going to use um, a different type of calorimeter. Um, and there, if you're taking the temperature of hot water and then you take that hot thermometer and you stick it in your cool solution, that can definitely mess up your calculations. Yeah. Um, so the last that we just did, the one where we had the thermometer in there, um, it wasn't meant to like touch the sides or anything because that's like a different amount. Of right, so the right? gas, the volatile gas one, volatile liquid, yes. yeah. So, so yeah, we did have a double boiler. So we had a flask with a volatile liquid inside of a beaker of boiling water. And we wanted the thermometer to be in the water, not touching the bottom of the beaker, not touching the side of the beaker. The beaker is not well insulated. And so the water boiling causes its own stirring. So we can be pretty sure that the water temperature is, is pretty equal, except at the very edges. Um, so at the very edge of the, the side of the beaker, the temperature there might be a little bit cooler because it's actively losing heat out the sides. That's why it feels warm outside. And at the bottom, it might be too hot because that's where all the heat from the hot plate is coming in. So anytime we measure the temperature of a liquid, we want the thermometer to be completely surrounded by the liquid and we'd like it to be in the middlest possible. So here, we can't really put it in the middle because that's where the bomb is, but we've got stirring here so that the temperature will get spread out into all of the water. And these walls are well insulated, and so we don't have to worry about loss of heat through the walls. Anybody else have any questions? Because I, I present this to you, but then as your questions show, there's a lot of very subtle details that it, when you experimentally do this, you have to watch out for some of those things, right? Okay, so the bomb calorimeter is used to measure change in energy for combustion reactions. Um, the bomb calorimeter has a specific mass and you put the same amount of water in it every time and so the bomb calorimeter behaves the same every time. So yes, Q for the calorimeter is MC delta T, but because the mass and the specific heat capacity don't change, we often just use the 
heat capacity for the calorimeter. We call it the calorimeter constant. So we measure that in a separate experiment to find out, okay, how does this calorimeter respond to temperature? If I put in five joules of energy, what does that do to the temperature? And you can calculate Q for the calorimeter. So, I'm sorry, C for the calorimeter. So Q, the heat absorbed by the calorimeter, is equal to the calorimeter constant times the change in temperature that we're measuring. And that is equal to, but opposite in sign, to the heat from the reaction. So Q reaction is equal to the change in energy for the reaction. So here's an example. When 1.550 grams of liquid hexane undergoes combustion in a bomb calorimeter, the temperature rises from 25.87 degrees Celsius to 38.13 degrees Celsius. Find the change in energy for the reaction in kilojoules per mole of hexane. To keep in mind, they're asking for specific units. We'll have to come back to that later. The heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter determined in a separate experiment is 5.73 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So we'll write stuff down. So we have 1.550 grams of hexane, C6H14. That's a mass. And then we've got an initial temperature of 25.87 degrees Celsius and a final temperature of 38.13 degrees Celsius. We're going to need the change in temperature, right? So let's just go ahead and calculate that. So the change in temperature is the 38.13 minus 25.87. degrees Celsius. Notice these temperatures have two decimal places. They're measured with a more precise thermometer because in that previous example where it had the water change of 1.5 degrees, that limited the number of sig figs in the answer. And so when you're really trying to get information, you're going to use a more precise thermometer so that difference in temperature um, doesn't limit your sig figs. And then the heat capacity for the calorimeter that's C for the calorimeter is 5.73 kilojoules per degree Celsius. <coughs> so we're trying to find delta E for the reaction. Delta E for the reaction is equal to Q for the reaction. Q for the reaction equals negative Q for the calorimeter. Because what the reaction loses, the calorimeter gains. And Q for the calorimeter is the calorimeter constant times the change in temperature. That C cal is mass and specific heat capacity together. This is in the calorimeter, this is about the only time we look at a heat capacity rather than a specific heat capacity. So can we calculate the heat for the calorimeter, Q cal? Do we have C cal and delta T? Yeah, we do. Here's C cal and there's delta T. So Q for the calorimeter is C cal times delta T. We're told that the C cal is the calorimeter constant 5.73 kilojoules per degree Celsius. And the change in temperature is 12.26 degrees Celsius. The degrees Celsius cancel out. Now kilojoule is not the unit that we've used here before, but is it actually a problem? No, it's okay. 12.26 times 5.73. <coughs> so Q for the calorimeter equals, bless you, 70.02498 kilojoules 
And if we look at significant figures, our calorimeter constant has three, and so that's what's going to limit that one. So that's what we measure. We can measure what happens to the calorimeter, but that tells us what happened with the reaction because the reaction and the calorimeter experience the same change in heat energy. It's just that it's going in a different direction, so the sign is opposite. So Q for the reaction is negative Q for the calorimeter. So it's negative 70.2498. That's a zero. Kilojoules. Q reaction is equal to delta E for the reaction because this is done at constant volume. <coughs> so is negative 70 kilojoules the answer we need? Not quite. It asked for kilojoules per mole of hexane. Yeah. Say that again? Thank you. Yep. I put the line under the wrong digit. It's supposed to be three sig figs. There we go. So this is the amount of energy, the change in energy for 1.550 grams of hexane. If I want to find out how much per one mole of hexane what I need to do is I need to take this mass, change it to moles, and divide this amount of energy by the number of moles. So 1.550 grams of C6H14. I'm going to convert this to moles. So I need the molar mass. Um, 12.01 times 6 plus 1.008 times 14, 86.172. So 1.550 divided by that is 0 0.1798. Nope, I lost a zero. That one's got four sig figs. And as often happens with this problem, I did not save enough space, so I'm going to have to move up to the top. <coughs> so the change in energy for the reaction is minus 70.2498 kilojoules. That's the amount of energy for 0 0.0179872 moles. So if I divide my 70 divide by the um, point zero one oops. we get thirty nine oh five point five well negative And that's kilojoules per mole. Multiple choice exam, that's enough there that you can pick the correct answer. But if it's mastering chemistry and it wants the correct number of significant figures, what are you going to do? Well, that zero is going to round up to a one. But then I have to hold the decimal place, so I could call it minus 3910 kilojoules. 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 Minus 3910 
kilojoules per mole. Separate this. That's got three sig figs. Or I could write it in scientific notation, which would be better, minus 3.91 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole. Any questions? On a multiple choice exam, will you like sometimes have the same number just with like a different sign on it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I will try to trick you with the sign. Yeah. I won't try to trick you with the sig figs. Like I wouldn't give you minus 3905.5 and minus 3910 and expect you to pick the minus 3910. But I might give you minus 3,910 and positive 3,910. Absolutely. Minus 3.19 times 10 to the third. 